Before James Wan's The Conjuring universe, but after his work in the Saw universe, he started another nightmare-inducing universe with Insidious. Given that we're going to return to this universe this year with Insidious 5, it's time to look back at the franchise so far. So if you're looking to catch up with the events, or if you've never seen them before but want to watch Insidious 5, or maybe you're too scared to watch them for yourself, and that's fine. Whatever the reason may be, I've got you covered. I made another video like this with all the movies in the Conjuring universe, so you should check that out if you haven't already. These videos are going to be very similar in that I'm going to go over each movie, giving you all the information you need to know, as well as my own brief review, before I get into how everything connects. If you just want to check out that portion of the video, it's time carded, so feel free, but you might be a little confused. So we start off with the first entry in this weird, mind-bending, and spine-chilling universe with the first film. So grab a snack and try to sit back and relax, maybe turn the lights on for this one as we journey through the world of Insidious. So our first movie more or less starts off like most other horror movies do. A new family moves into a house that turns out to be haunted. The wife starts experiencing some paranormal activity, and the husband isn't too quick to believe her. And this seems like a pretty generic horror movie that I've seen a ton of times before. But it's the nuances and the blend of genres and tropes that make Insidious stand apart. Pretty early on, their son Dalton gets put into a coma, and we don't exactly know why that is, doctors can't seem to figure it out, we just know that he encountered whatever kind of monster, ghost, demon is in the attic, and boom, he's in a coma. But if the house is haunted, why not just move away? Come on, we've all said it in every horror movie, so in this one, that's exactly what they do, but the hauntings don't stop there. As a last resort and almost desperation at this point, the Lambert family calls on paranormal expert Elise Rayner, and with the introduction to Elise comes a very pivotal point in both the franchise, but also what makes this movie stand apart. Elise explains that their son Dalton is a gifted astral projectionalist, meaning that while he's sleeping, his mind can wander into a different realm called the Further. Dalton wandered so far into the Further that it's responsible for his comatose state, and now that he's trapped there, his body is a kind of vessel for all kinds of different spirits, hence all the ghosts that the family has been seeing. Dalton inherited this gift from his father, Josh, and we learn that Josh once had to meet with Elise to get his own mind back from the further. Since Josh is the only one who knows how to do this, it's up to him to travel to this place and get his son back, and though his son makes it back, it seems that Josh did not. Now, this movie is through and through a James Wan film. It pays respect to the genre itself, but also takes a lot of the tropes and spins them on their head. This is a very typical horror movie at first glance, but the deeper the story goes, the more different it gets. With Josh having to astral project his body into a different realm because he's the only one who knows how to do it, even though he's reluctant to do so and even believe all of this at first, it gives Josh a pretty typical hero's journey type of structure, and while some people may not like that aspect, I think it's pretty cool to mix in your typical adventure storyline with a horror movie. On multiple rewatches, you start to notice small things like how Josh doesn't have any family photo albums of his childhood while Renee does, and Josh's mom says that she's surprised Renee got him to stand still for a single photograph. These small foreshadowing moments make multiple watches that much more rewarding, and the same definitely goes for the rest of the series as well. The music in this film is nothing less than bone chilling. It almost sounds as if somebody took all the instruments that they could carry and just dropped them on the floor in a long empty hallway, and that's the soundtrack. It doesn't sound like it would be good, and it might not be, I'm not too sure, but it certainly gets the job done to deliver the scares in this film. Speaking of scares, I think that this movie has like the best jump scare of all time. For test audiences, I think that this jump scare of the demon Darth Maul is like the highest ever recorded heart rate jump, and no one else would ever have been able to achieve that except for James Wan. Watching this movie after I've watched all the Conjuring films, I can see the clear inspiration that this movie had for the first Conjuring film. They both have a team of ghost hunters, the one who can see the evil spirits, Patrick Wilson, if anything, Insidious feels a bit like a proof of concept for The Conjuring. Although this one does have a bit more of the fantastical aspects to it. While it's not extremely noticeable, it is starting to become apparent that this movie was made 13 years ago. 
Some of the more supernatural effects have aged just a bit, but it's only like one or two or three scenes, so it's not that bad. Patrick Wilson once again proves how great of an actor he is in this film, particularly in the second half of the film. Overall, I really liked the blend of classic heroic tropes with the horror genre. I think it does a great job at subverting the horror tropes as well. I really like the ending, it's very open-ended and leaves us on a huge cliffhanger, but luckily for us, we don't have to wait because there's Insidious Chapter 2. I give the first Insidious movie an 8.5 out of 10. We start off with a flashback to a young Josh Lambert getting help from a younger Elise, giving some greater context to the first movie and how all of Josh's hauntings actually started. There's some strange happenings that we witness in Josh's childhood home, and not all of it makes a ton of sense, but at the end, Josh forgets about all of his abilities and all the strange happenings which sets the stage for the first movie. But after the intro, Insidious Part 2 picks up right where the first one left off, and while the first one ended on a pretty big cliffhanger, the answer isn't exactly as crazy as it was made out to be. But we continue forward after the death of Elise. Renee gives her side of the story to the police, who tell her that they're waiting on some fingerprints to see if her husband Josh is the one who killed Elise. The Lamberts move on with their life, but the hauntings don't stop. It's here where the storylines start to branch off. Lorraine goes with the two guys who worked with Elise. I learned their names are Spex and Tucker in this one because they have a much bigger role, and they work with one of Elise's old colleagues named Carl. Renee continues getting haunted by the strange occurrences at Josh's enormous and strangely lit childhood home, while Carl, Lorraine, Spex, and Tucker dig deeper into the backstory of Josh's childhood haunting. It's then revealed that Josh isn't actually Josh, and he's stuck in the further. Lorraine gets Renee out of the house while the boys hatch a plan to sedate Josh that goes horribly wrong. Carl meets the real Josh in the further, and with the help of Elise and eventually Dalton, Josh makes it back to his body in time to reunite with his family. He and Dalton forget about their abilities once and for all, and they move on with their life. But just like the ending of the first film, oh my god, hey look, it's Jenna Ortega. Somebody notices something horrifying, and it's another cliffhanger. Like every sequel in the world, Insidious Chapter 2 goes much bigger with its story this time around. And for the most part, a lot of these grand plots pay off very well. There's obviously something off with Josh for the first half of the film, and it's pretty obvious that he's possessed by the woman in black. No, not that woman in black, but the actual backstory of who this person is is executed very well and gives good reason for the dual storylines in the film. James Wan is once again a masterful horror director, and he builds suspense with his use of cinematography incredibly well. This film also blends in some found footage aspects because of Specs and Tucker using their cameras, and while I think these scenes were only added because found footage was really popular at the time, it actually has aged incredibly well and is a pretty unique tool used throughout the film. Specs and Tucker are once again used for comedic relief, and I think for the most part their comedic moments are well placed, but there's a few moments that kinda take away from the tension of the moment. The use of the further in this film is so incredibly well done. It adds a ton of different dimensions to both this story and the grander story of the universe. I mentioned that not everything makes sense in the prologue of the film, and that's because the modern day Josh actually goes back in time in the further to ask his past self more questions about the ghost that's haunting him. This is a very cool scene and gives you a lot more questions about the further, but easily the best scene in the film is when Josh, in the further, goes to visit the house from the first movie, and it explains a lot of the hauntings that we saw in that film. In the first film, these moments are your pretty standard horror movie moments. Josh goes to close the door, goes away, comes back to see the door open. Pretty scary stuff. But this film adds so many extra layers to both this sequel and the first movie. This basically proves that time is like a fifth dimension in the further, and that poses a lot more questions than answers. There's also another moment in the further when Elise comes in to save the day, when she explains to them that there's another place after the further, a better place, but she's come back to help them since she heard them calling. This is obviously referring to some kind of afterlife, but it's not done in an overly religious context, and I like that. 
whether you're religious or not, I think we would all like to think that there's some kind of afterlife, and the further is not exactly that afterlife we're looking for, so this single line adds a lot to this universe and even more questions, but this one might be one of those times where questions don't always need to be answered. While there's no jump scare on par with this one, In this movie, there's a moment that I think is even more terrifying without even needing to be a jump scare. Like I mentioned, there's something strange going on with Josh, and we don't really know what that is until about halfway through the movie. But throughout the first half of the movie, Renee keeps hearing somebody play the piano, and she realizes that it's the song she wrote for Josh, but when she confronts Josh about this, he has no idea what this song is, and he kind of just brushes off the conversation. We later see Josh talking to somebody at the piano for a minute before getting up to walk away. There's a quick flash to the further, where we see the real Josh screaming for help and attention while playing that song on the piano. This moment didn't make me jump at all, but it sent shivers down my spine. This was the first time that we actually see the real Josh in the movie, and to see him in such distress, not knowing what he's gone through in the further, and also knowing he's been trying to communicate with Renee for the whole movie, is deeply terrifying. There's a big rule in the horror genre that the more you show the monster, the less scary it is. It's why the first Blair Witch movie never showed the monster, because your imagination is far scarier than anything that any filmmaker could ever bring to screen. The same rings true for this scene. The storyline was already split into two segments in this film. If you added a third of Josh in the further, then this scene isn't very scary, and it doesn't quite pack the emotional punch that it does right now. Chapter 2 continues to develop these characters into real people that we can actually root for, maybe just because it's Patrick Wilson and I think he's a fantastic and supremely underrated actor, but Josh is a very good character and an easy person to root for. Dalton also gets a moment to shine in a like revenge kind of way, going back into the further to get his father back, and this mirrors the ending of the first film really well. Elise proves to be really popular, getting a moment to come in at the last second and save Josh and Carl, and for a new character, Carl is also a really likable dude. It's very hard to make likable horror movie characters, but with both Insidious and The Conjuring, James Wan proves that he has the ability to do it. The ending of the film is actually really beautiful. After everything that this family has been through, they finally get their happy ending, or so it seems, and everything gets wrapped up with a nice bow. I almost wish that this storyline itself of Josh being trapped in the Upside Down wasn't actually resolved until a third movie. If this movie was about getting the ghost to leave Josh's body and then a third movie was about getting him back, I think that would have been a fantastic trilogy. But I'm almost happier that it's not because it didn't need to be. This was one story told across two movies and that's all that needed to happen. That's clearly the story that James Wan wanted to tell because this was his last movie as the director. I think this film does a very good job as a sequel. There's a few aspects that aren't as great as the first film, but there's also a few aspects that weren't in the first film that are fantastic. All around, I'd say this movie lived up to the expectations of the first film, I'd give it an 8.2 out of 10. But because James Wan did such a masterful job at crafting the character of Elise, and because both Insidious movies were such a hit, a third movie was greenlit, landing us at Insidious Part 3. Insidious Chapter 3 gives us a prequel, not specifically about Elise, but about a random family that gets Elise back involved in this business, because apparently she left the business sometime after she helped Josh, but before she helped Dalton. A girl named Quinn comes to Elise to talk about her mother, who recently passed away. Elise reluctantly says yes, asking Quinn some things about her mother, and Quinn tells her that her mom loved old music. And what's sitting in the background? A jukebox. Oh, I wonder what's gonna... Oh, the jukebox actually never goes off. Okay, maybe I'm not as smart as I think I am, or maybe this movie is just dumb. Anyways, Elise has some kind of episode and says, yep, I'm not gonna help you out. But Quinn starts getting haunted, and Elise comes back into the fold to save the day. The worst thing I can say about this movie is that it doesn't feel like an insidious film. While the first two films, especially the first one, had pretty standard horror movie tropes, they subverted these tropes in really clever ways. This film doesn't do that. This is a very standard horror movie, and all of the things that make this a prequel are easily the best parts. In being a prequel, this movie succeeds. 
we get some greater context on Elise, who recently lost her husband, which makes her afterlife line in part two all the more great. We see how Spex and Tucker met Elise and how they all started working together, and there's a lot of moments of foreshadowing that make a lot of sense if you've seen the first two films. But all of these prequel aspects are just the B plot of the movie. The main plot is not very good. Quinn isn't immediately a very likable protagonist. In fact, I was more with the dad the whole movie. This guy was clearly trying his best to raise two kids, work a full-time job, and grieve the passing of his wife all at the same time, and the daughter tells her friend how much she hates her dad, and I just felt bad for the guy. The further comes back in this film, and it's where Elise gives it that name, and it proves to still be the most interesting aspect of this universe. I feel like in a lot of different horror movies, there's always this like other side or ghosts that have to come from somewhere, and the further is a physical manifestation of that other side, and while a lot of times it's better not to have answers to all of our questions when it comes to these things, the further does an incredible job of showing us how this universe works, and this is a very unique aspect that really only the Insidious films have. Even when we get to see the further, everything about it isn't explained and there's always new layers added in each film, and I hope that trend continues and doesn't get overly explained, because it doesn't need to be. This film came out in 2015, and maybe it's because the technology was better, or maybe because this film had almost 10 times the budget that the first film had, but the special effects are certainly better, and this film doesn't feel nearly as aged as the previous two when it comes to the effects. As much as I think the main plot of the film is pretty generic, the ending of this film is very emotional and combines all the plots and the aspects from the further to give us a very strong ending. At the end of the movie, all the dots are connected, we have all the answers to our questions in terms of the prequel aspects, but wait, this is an insidious film, there needs to be a giant cliffhanger ending, so we'll add in a really weird CGI face of the demon from the first film, because then it connects to the first film? Somehow, I guess? But this demon wasn't haunting Elise, it was haunting Dalton, so why would it be in her house? This was clearly just to somehow try and tie these movies together, but it's not really needed. We see Carl talking to Elise about Josh and the woman that was haunting him, and now subsequently her, and that's enough to connect these films together. If anything, this jump scare of the demon doesn't make any sense. I really feel like the Conjuring films were like the fully realized versions of the Insidious films, because the Conjuring movies always had a really clever way to connect the universe together. And so far, this movie didn't really have any clever way to connect anything, this jump scare didn't make any sense, and it was clearly just put in to make you go, oh look, it's the demon from the first movie, let's go home and watch Insidious 1 now. But in terms of the actual story, there was no reason to put this demon here. What would have been a good ending? Well, Elise has been talking about her husband the whole film and how much she wanted to see him again, then Elise thinks that he put this sweater on the bed for her, but the dog starts barking. Elise gets all curious, and that's when the jump scare happens, but if they kept all of these aspects, take out the jump scare, and then have Elise's face drop her curiosity and then smile, then that could have been the end. That gives you some questions that are open-ended with a pretty obvious conclusion in your mind, and it also subverts the expectations of the fans of these films, because there's been a pretty needless jump scare and cliffhanger ending in all three of these films now. I think what disappoints me the most about this film is that it's called Insidious Chapter 3. This is very much not Chapter 3. It's more like Chapter 0, because there's absolutely no resolution for the cliffhanger ending of the second film, and if the ending of the second film was telling us the demon from the first film was coming back, then the ending of this movie is the exact same thing. Overall, there's some good aspects in this film, but it's nowhere near the quality of the first two. I'll give it like a 6 out of 10. So Insidious The Last Key is yet another prequel, but a sequel to the last movie. This one takes us back to Elise's childhood, where her abusive father locks her in the basement because he thinks Elise is just trying to scare her brother with all of her ghost stories because he doesn't believe in her abilities. After a pretty extensive prologue, we're brought back to, well, not modern day Elise because she's dead, but after the last movie, before the first movie. She gets a call from a man who's now living in her childhood home asking for her help, so her, Specs, and Tucker take a drive to five of Keys, New Mexico to confront the demons of the past. Along the way, she reunites with her estranged brother and her nieces that didn't know about her, nieces that also share her abilities. 
I think what works with this movie is that it's not too focused on being a prequel, and it's telling its own story. The last movie was a little too focused on things being a prequel and setting up a lot of future events, whereas this one just completely centers on Elise, which I find to be a bit funny. Elise is like the pillar of this franchise, yet she died at the end of the first movie, so she's been in all four of these, but dead since the end of the first one. This kind of goes along with my opinion that all prequels just kind of suck. There's inherently less stakes, and while there can be some interesting events or stories, they never carry as much weight behind them because we know nothing horrible is going to happen to these characters. But where this movie succeeds is the twist that happens about halfway through. I won't spoil too much, the story was at least semi-interesting beforehand since you have characters like Elise, Spex, and Tucker in the front seat, but when the twist happened I was thoroughly surprised and it made the viewing experience of the movie that much better afterwards. Talking about Specs and Tucker, I've really grown a soft spot for them over the course of the franchise. They each have their own unique quirks, and while they're not like multi-layered characters with a lot of depth, there was a moment in the beginning of the movie where I thought that they weren't going to be in it for very long, but then they tagged along with Elise on her journey, and I was very happy that they were going to be there. So I didn't really know I was going to miss them until I thought they were going to be gone. As for the story of this film itself, it's weirdly the most supernatural and least grounded movie of the franchise. While every film goes into a strange spirit realm, they all seem to be at least a little bit grounded in regards to being a supernatural horror movie. This one has the demon turn off the screams in people's bodies with a key, and that just seems like something that would have never happened in the first film. Is this a good thing? A bad thing? I don't really know, kinda up for you to decide. It did strike me as a bit strange in comparison to the last three films, but nothing that really kept me out of the story. The most disappointing thing in this film is that the further takes a back seat. There's maybe like five total minutes that they spend in the further, which is by far the least amount of time that they've spent there in all the movies, and it doesn't really add anything new when it comes to this really interesting other side. There is a weird moment towards the end of the movie where they open a red door and it takes us to where Dalton falls off the ladder in the attic from the first movie, but then they leave and there's no further explanation of this scene. Was this put in just to connect the dots a bit more? Because if you remember, this is the scene where Dalton screams and right after this he's put in the coma, but Elise didn't do anything to him. The only thing I can think of is that she left the door open, and then the demon from the first film came and got him from there, but otherwise there's no explanation at all. Speaking of the demon from the first film, this film, The Last Key, makes the ending of the third film make absolutely no sense. Why was there this jump scare of the demon like it was following Elise around if it wasn't going to be in this movie? And I guess it kind of is in this movie, but only because the ending of this movie leads directly into the first movie, so the ending to the last movie makes even less sense than it already did. Unless you're trying to say that the demon was following Elise around and when she opened the door to Dalton, the demon went in and started haunting Dalton instead, all because she didn't close the door and Dalton's haunting would then be her own fault, but that's a lot of logical hoops to jump through for something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This film came out in 2018, and by that point the Conjuring universe was well underway, having multiple entries and spin-offs that all connect. And when I realized this, I realized that Insidious was trying to do the very same thing with this movie, and possibly some others as well. This is the lowest rated movie of the franchise, but still did very well financially, and honestly I think 5.7 is a little too low. It should be right there as like a 6.1 with Insidious Chapter 3. And the first two movies have criminally low ratings to begin with. Now for the moment you've all been waiting for, how all of these movies connect together. Maybe some of you just skipped ahead to this moment in time. If you did, that's fine. Welcome. Though a lot of this may not make a ton of sense without the context of the rest of the video, I'll try my best. I'm going to be going over the chronological events of this universe, and if you're wondering what movie it is, just look up right here and I'll tell you. The easiest way to traverse this timeline is to follow Elise Rayner on her journey. So we'll start with her childhood. Elise lived in Five Keys, New Mexico, just outside of prison or death row with her family. She was incredibly gifted at communicating with the other side from an early age, but her father didn't like this very much and didn't believe her. 
He abused her and locked her in the basement, and one night when she was locked in the basement, she communicates with a demon behind a red door. This demon puts her in a trance, and during this trance, her mother is somehow killed. Elise continued living with her brother and abusive father until she was 16, where she encountered a ghost in her house. When her father rounds the corner, she tells him about this, but he doesn't believe her, and right when she's going to receive another beating, she shows her father her abilities firsthand with how he He's gonna die. She runs out of the house and runs away, her father saying that nobody is ever gonna love her and leaving her younger brother behind. Some time later, Elise is an adult and a full-time medium. She gets a call from Lorraine Lambert about how her son Josh needs help because he's being haunted by a demon in a black wedding dress. Elise helps warding off the demon by helping Josh forget that he's a gifted traveler. Some time later, Elise retires as a medium after the death of her husband, because the woman in the black dress always comes to try and kill her whenever she reaches out to the other side. When a young woman named Quinn Brenner comes and asks for Elise's help, Elise agrees but gets attacked by the demon in the black dress again, so she tells her that she can't help her. When things get worse, Quinn's father approaches Elise and asks for her help again. Elise knows that she can ultimately help Quinn, so she agrees, meeting Tucker and Specs on this journey. While Elise successfully helps Quinn get rid of the demon haunting her, the demon in the black dress continues following Elise, giving her a glimpse at her ultimate demise. After Quinn's case, Elise, Specs, and Tucker are now a fully-fledged team tackling these kinds of cases together. Elise receives a phone call from somebody living in her childhood home about how he's being haunted. Elise, Specs, and Tucker travel back to Five Keys in order to help this man, and while they find out that he's being haunted, he's also being possessed by an entity that also possessed her father. This demon forcing them to capture young girls and keep them in their basement for some reason. Elise reunites with her estranged brother that she left all those years ago and meets her nieces for the first time. Nieces that also share her abilities. When Elise goes into the further to help one of her nieces, she gets trapped there, forcing the other niece to travel into the further to get them both out. On their way out, they go into one of the red doors and see a young boy in an attic. They leave the room, but leave the door open. This young boy is Dalton Lambert. He and his family have just recently moved into a new home. Dalton is the son of Josh Lambert, the boy that Elise helped back when she was a younger woman. Dalton is also a gifted traveler, just like his father was, and because of this, Dalton notices something when Elise and the girls come through the door. But they don't close the door, and because of that, something horrible gets in. Elise gets a phone call about Dalton, but she knows about the haunting already. She's seen things, things that no one, not even the audience, could see at the time. Elise goes to help Dalton, having to explain to Josh that they've already met before because she helped him when he was a child too. She tells Josh that only he can travel into the further and get his son back, so Josh does, warding off the spirits and demons to get his son back to his body. But when Josh travels to the further, he sees the woman in the black dress again. He tries to get rid of her once and for all, but it only allows the woman to come back to the surface using Josh's body. Elise notices that Josh isn't really Josh, so she snaps a photograph of him, and Josh, really the demon, snaps her neck. While the Lamberts have Dalton back, something strange is going on with Josh, because it's not really Josh, he's still stuck in the further, trying everything he can to tell his wife Renee that it's not really him up there. Tucker and Specs enlist the help of Elise's old colleague Carl, as well as Josh's mom, Lorraine, to uncover what's going on with Josh and who the woman in the black dress really is. They uncover that the woman in the black dress is not really a woman at all, but a man named Parker Crane. When Parker realizes he's compromised, he retaliates, doing what his mother tells him to do and kill the family. Dalton goes back to the further to bring his father back this time, with the help of Elise, who hasn't been trapped in the further, but someplace greater beyond that. Dalton and Josh are rescued, and they both forget about their abilities, going to live happier lives. Tucker and Specs continue their duty with a deceased Elise still helping them. When they go to help another young woman, hey, it's Janet Ortega, Elise notices something on the wall behind the young woman, something that sounds like the lipstick face demon. And that's, if you can believe it, the entire Insidious universe so far. While there's been four movies, the most recent event that actually happened was at the end of Insidious 2, and we have no conclusion for what she saw and what's happened since then. But what, that surely can't be it, right? 
Well, for now it is, but in a few months, or weeks, days, maybe it's out by the time you're watching this, we're getting Insidious 5, or Insidious Fear the Dark, I'm not really sure. The latest entry in the Insidious franchise, which has yet to have any trailer or official photos, is slated to come out in July of 2023. So surely there should be a trailer or something sometime soon. There's not much information on this project, it seems pretty heavily guarded, but there are some set photos that were taken at a cemetery of the Lambert family attending a funeral. Now, the easiest conclusion to jump to is that this is Elise's funeral, but given how much older these kids are and that the plot takes place 10 years after Chapter 2, this would be a very long-awaited funeral. My guess is that this could actually be Josh's mom, Lorraine. I haven't seen her in any of these set photos unless this is her right here, but I don't think it is. The plot description tells us that Dalton is going to begin college, but that's about it. I'm very happy to see the Lambert family coming back, but I'm especially happy that the man himself, Patrick Wilson, is going to be directing the film as well. And this will be Patrick Wilson's directorial debut. This really means one of two things. They came up with a really great story, and the cast really loves it, and Patrick Wilson is very much into it, or they all kind of need some work, and the studio sees this film as kind of whatever, since there hasn't been an Insidious movie in five years, if it does well, great, if it doesn't, then it doesn't really matter. Personally, I'd like to think that they have a really solid story set in place, something so great that Patrick Wilson wanted to take the reins over completely as a first-time director. Patrick Wilson is very close friends with James Wan, so I think we'll be seeing some of James's influence on Patrick's style, so that can only mean really great things. But do people really want more Insidious movies? It's been five years, and there's the far more popular Conjuring franchise that Patrick Wilson is the star of, so why another Insidious movie? Well, I think what I said before rings true. It's been five years, if this movie flops, oh well, but if it does well, then there could very well be more Insidious movies on the way. There were a lot of rumors a while ago that Insidious and Sinister were part of the same universe, and that a crossover movie was in the works, but there hasn't been any information on that in a while. I think that this movie, Insidious 5, or Fear the Dark, is going to be the make or break it movie for this franchise, and personally, I think and hope that Patrick Wilson is going to kill it with this next film. Those are all my thoughts on the Insidious franchise. Let me know your thoughts and which one is your favorite movie. Also, let me know if I missed anything on how it all connects. I think I got all the bullet points down, but if I missed it and there's some major Insidious fans watching, let me know. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out my video on the Conjuring franchise right here. If you do, then I'll see you in the next one. Yeah.